Hey everyone, Kirsten Kroll here with The Rink Live, your juniors and prospects reporter. It's been a busy weekend all around the hockey world, and I'll be joined shortly here by Matt Wellens, McHatton, Jess Myers, and Brad Schlossman. So very excited to be hosting this for the very first time, and excited to talk about a fun weekend in college hockey with all of you guys. Hi, Jess. How are you doing? Hey, guys. How are you? How's everybody? Good. Trying to get I'm Mick in my car in once again. Quick. There he is. Mick, Mick, Mick's no trouble. No problem I'll at all. You. You're a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy Monday. It was a busy weekend. All of the college hockey teams that we cover in action. Let's just kind of go around the horn here to start things off and figure out how everything went down. Jess, starting with you, busy weekend for the Gophers at Notre Dame. Yeah, I was out in South Bend. Uh, stop me if you've heard this before. Gophers played really well on Friday, got a win. Didn't play quite as well on Saturday. They lost in overtime, but they came out of South Bend with four out of six points. Generally pretty happy with that. Um, this is, a, as you know, a weird time for the Gophers because Three guys got off the plane on Saturday night and got on a different plane to go to China on Sunday morning. So uh, Michigan State coming up this weekend, and we're going to see uh, a, a much different Gopher team and kind of see how they react to the loss of two of their top forwards and, and maybe their best defensemen. For sure. And Matt, Minnesota Duluth taking on Western Michigan. What were some of the big takeaways from that series? I mean, two really even teams out there. Um, you know, the big difference, again, I think is special teams. The Bulldogs' power play um, they did get a, a goal on Saturday. Um, I like to say they got an unofficial power play goal on, on Friday. Um, they picked up one a few seconds after a, a Broncos penalty expired. But, um, you know, usually four out of a six points is, is, I would say, a, a good weekend for any team against Western Michigan. But, but Scott Sandlin uh, reminds me of when they split at North Dakota. Um, they're, they're really kicking themselves for not getting uh, six points against the Broncos. Uh, here in Duluth. I mean, the, the four points keeps them sort of in the NCHC title race. Denver's really pulling away here now after picking up sweeps. Um, still no sweeps for the Bulldogs. They've kept the sweep in NCHC series, but they're the only team that's picked up three points, at least three points um, this season. I mean, the Bulldogs came away with, um, you know, they split at Western earlier this year. Um, they, they get four out of six this weekend. Again, I think the Bulldogs would have liked to cash in on a late power play there to, to sweep the Broncos. That would have been a big boost for them in, in the league standings. Absolutely. And Mick, St. Cloud State heading up to Grand Forks, North Dakota. Not an ideal Friday night for the Huskies, but talk about Friday and then their how they, uh, kind of respond on Saturday. Yeah, you know, Friday they – uh, you know, they, they lose 7-1, to one, I, and I, I think Brad had it in his story, whatever, that it was the worst loss that St. Cloud State has suffered since 2010. So, I mean, that – so after St. Cloud State put – you know, you, you turn back the clock when they played here in St. Cloud. Uh, St. Cloud State put the wood to, <laughs> to North Dakota on Friday, and then, you know, the Fighting Hawks responded the next night and beat St. Cloud State. Uh, St. Cloud State had a three to one lead on on Saturday uh, up in Grand Forks and weren't able to hold on to that. You ended up going to the shootout, so they get two points out of the weekend. Uh, I I thought they really needed three, uh, you know, to to get into a little bit better position. Um, but now they're really there's some tough sledding, you know, for for them coming up here because their schedule is. Uh, is brutal coming up, and you're, you're taking Nick Perbex, who is red hot, out of their lineup, and you're taking Sam Hentges out, and you're taking your head coach out um, for a couple of weeks, and uh, th that's going to be very difficult for them. So, uh, you know, they played a lot better, obviously, on Saturday, um, but, uh, you know, they're going to have to, you know, now that we have the makeup dates against UMD, they're going to have to, that's where they're going to have to, to do some, some damage if they're going to try to get home ice at all. They're going to have to do that head to head with UMD because they got four games left of them. And uh, two of them are at home and two on, on the road. Yeah. And so the season doesn't get any easier at this point. Things are only heating up. And I'd love to get Brad's perspective too from the North Dakota side of things and trying to get him involved in the chat too but right now technical difficulties are not allowing me to do so. 
with the Instagram live. So, Brad, I'm sorry, I'm trying. Um, so we're just kind of keeping you in limbo here for the moment. But, you know, speaking of which, all of the teams that you guys covered, you mentioned being affected by losing players to the Olympics. Women start on Wednesday. The men currently grouping together in L.A. Let's talk a little bit about what is to come on the national stage for the and how it's going to affect the teams back home for college hockey. Yeah, I think the Bulldog, the, it will, if we want to start with the, the women, they're getting underway on, on Wednesday. Um, I'm going to post a schedule, at least for it, – it'll be the entire Olympic women's hockey schedule because there's a Bulldog on almost every um, Olympic <laughs> women's hockey team coming up here, which means I'm going to be watching a lot of games at 10, 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. and, and such, and we'll, we'll see how my uh, sleep goes here. Um, should ask Brad for his tips for watching the uh, Australian <laughs> Open overnight uh, when he when he does you, that. But, you you have a three year old. When would you actually sleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's been waking me up in the middle of the night lately. So um, he's a good early wake up call. The seven o'clock games will be no problem for me to be up for. It's nice. those uh, ten ten games. I may not be able to stay awake through through all of them. But um, you know, for the Bulldog women, you know, the big story going into the Olympics was. How are they going to handle losing their starting goaltender, Emma Soderberg? Um, I mean, when you look at all the men's and women's teams uh, in college hockey that are that are losing players, that might have been the, the biggest hit to lose an UMD losing an All-American and All-League goaltender um, for the entire end of the regular season. But uh, JoJo Chobeck's been, been solid again. Um, she wasn't great on Saturday against Minnesota State, uh, let in a couple of goals that she probably wanted back. But UMD has the offense to counter that right now. Um, unlike the men's team who, who doesn't put up, you know, um, you know, four points a game or anything like that very often, the women are able to do that. Um, I think the women's tournament's going to be interesting. I know it's always U.S. and Canada, but I'm always curious if, if someone's going to jump into the mix there and, and challenge either of those teams, whether it's um, Sweden getting back on, on the big stage here after getting relegated briefly. Um, you got Switzerland and, and Lara Stalder. Um, you know, that's a team that's medaled before. Uh, Finland's had, uh, you know, they've been able to medal. That's actually the one team that doesn't – they have a Bulldog that was here for a semester. I don't know if we count her or not among former Bulldogs. But, um, you know, the Czech Republic is – or Czechia, which, whatever we're calling them now. Um, they have Katarina Morzova. She's been a pretty talented – she's gotten a lot better as a, as a professional in Sweden and such. So, um, it'll be interesting. The, the men's side is, is – uh, they're all in L.A. I believe they arrived there today. Um, Bulldog Insider Podcast. We're going to talk to Noah Cates and, and Brett Larson this evening while they're in their hotel rooms. I believe they have a brief quarantine <laughs> period going on here uh, out in Los Angeles. Um, kudos to those guys for getting to go somewhere warm here for a few days uh, after what we've had in, in Minnesota. Um, all the North Dakota and St. Cloud and UMD players, uh, congrats to them. Uh, just to get someplace warm before going to the the Olympics and such. So, um, and then yeah, it'll be, it's it'll be interesting. The men's side, I feel like guys is so wide open because we're like the women's. Like we've seen the U.S. and Canada; those teams have been together now for months. Um, the European teams, though, they're all used to playing with each other, uh, so it's nothing new. But these men's teams are all literally coming together at the you know a week before the Olympics to try and figure things out it really does have that world juniors vibe to it i don't know if the europeans are more familiar with each other than than the americans it, it kind of sounded like every national team was scrambling going into this olympics after the nhl pulled out yeah we talked with we talked with brock faber over, over the you know last at the end of last week and i i asked him i said how many of these guys have you played with before you all either because he's a national development program guy uh, and a guy who's played on two World Juniors teams for for Team USA, and he uh, just correct me if I'm wrong. I think he said he had played with six or seven. He thought of right. Those it, guys. It's an interesting situation because not only has he played with a lot of those guys in World Junior settings or whatever, but then you look at Team Canada; they've got two guys from Michigan. I mean, you know, it's like you, you see, uh, you know, a lot of players that you've played against as well. Because keep in mind, when you're with the National Team Development Program, you're playing tournaments overseas, and you've seen a lot of these players before. So there's that kind of weird 
familiarity there too. The other cool thing for Brock Faber, I was going to say, is that uh, you know the training camp is out in L.A. and I believe it's at the L.A. Kings facility, and he's a Kings draft pick, so he gets kind of a a little bit of a preview of where he might get to work someday. Uh, Kirsten, by the way, I wanted to compliment you for wearing the NCHC pullover. I hope that's in honor of Michael Wiseman, uh, the the media relations director for the NCHC, who is the biggest Cincinnati Bengals fan I know. Congrats to him. Congrats to the Bengals. Uh, you know. Uh, it, it was only three years after their last Super Bowl that UMD won its last conference uh, regular season title. So that's so, the you know. only Bengals fan you probably know. <laughs> hey, I don't know the past day, but bandwagon <laughs> fan over here. <laughs> it was a great day to be one. Yes, a lot of absolutely. Fun we had, but yeah, thank you. I felt you know while I'm waiting for my rink live apparel to come in that the NCHC quarter zip was the next best thing. So. We've got some supply chain issues. Just be patient. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got used to Phil taking on this podcast. So, I mean, I, I had to show up and be professional to hang out with you. Today. Um, and Mick, too, something I wanted to ask you. I know that you guys had talked about it last week as well, but I think Cloud State is being affected with the Olympics. You lose Sam Henches, Nick Pervix for the next few weeks. But also, too, head coach Brett Larson. How do you think the Huskies are going to be able to respond to that? Well, I, you know, I, th I, I think if, if it was a younger team, I, I think you'd, I, I, if I was a St. Cloud State fan, I'd be a little bit more concerned. But this is a really older, you know, I mean, they are dominated by juniors and seniors and fifth-year guys, right? So, I mean, so that alone, I guess, uh, you know, uh, makes me – not be, I guess, as, as concerned that there's going to be a huge drop off with it. They felt all along that they've had nine defensemen that they could be, um, you know, having play on a, on a night to night basis. That said, you know, and I and I like, you know, Luke Jaycox brings, you know, some different things. Let's say it's Luke that, that comes into the lineup or Brady Zimmer. Both of those guys are kind of more stand at home defensemen, guys that are going to play physical, uh, which I'm not saying they don't need that, but, you know, taking Nick Perfix off the top power play unit is a big deal. I mean, this is the top power play unit in the country, and you're taking two guys off the top power play unit when you take Henches and Perfix out of there. Um, and that's where a lot of their offense has been to this point. So, I mean, I think from that standpoint, you know, you know, from that standpoint, you know, just trying to fill those two spots, I mean – they have guys that are capable of stepping into the lineup and, and playing, um, but the, are they going to bring the same element, or are different guys going to have to step up and play kind of different roles for them? You know, a guy like Josh Litke, does he maybe see a little bit more time on the power play now with Perfect being out as one example? Um, you know, from a leadership standpoint, I mean, the fact that Dave Shyak has been a head coach before and he's basically kind of taking – over the head coaching, you know, position here for the couple of weeks that they're gone. I think that's helpful. They went through this a couple of years ago uh, with the World Junior Championships when Brett was on Scott Sandlin's staff. Uh, so Nick Oliver has been through this before. RJ Inga, uh, they, they're in a unique situation. Their director of hockey ops is a guy who, for I think it was seven seasons, was an assistant coach at Colorado College, and they've gotten – a waiver on him so that he's actually going to be able to help out on the bench. Uh, so th they've got a guy stepping in that knows his way around the NCHC, knows this team very well. Uh, so, I, you know, from, from a leadership standpoint, I don't think there's things to be concerned about. From, a, okay, can they – how are they going to fill up these two particular spots? That's more of a concern, you know. And I'll give out, you know, since uh, – Matt was talking a little bit about, about the women's side. Uh, you know, an impressive thing for St. Cloud State, on, uh, for the St. Cloud State women on Friday, they ended up tying Wisconsin at home one-to-one. Uh, -one. And Emma Pelusny had, I think it was 55 saves uh, in that game. Uh, and they ended up tying. And that's without uh, Yanina Newland and uh, without Claire Himlerova, who are both uh, going to be playing in the Olympics and are gone already. Um, so – uh, you know that was a I, that was an eye opener uh, for me, I guess, to see that that score and uh, you know and Emma's. Uh, I, I just actually wrote about her last week a little bit uh, about how she's kind of 
most every uh, goaltending uh, career number at St. Cloud State is she's in the top one or two uh, now, and uh, and then she <laughs> then she knocks off fifty five save performance against Wisconsin, which yeah, everybody here knows uh, that's no small task. Yeah, not um, not bad feet whatsoever. Very impressive from her. She uh, just was top of her for a while now. So awesome things to see. And Matt, I think I accidentally cut you off right if you were about to say something. So I'll pass the torch to you. Yeah, I was going to say what's interesting in women's hockey is like on the men's side, we're talking about all like the top teams, you know, losing, you know, the Gophers, Michigan, St. Cloud, UMD, North Dakota, like losing their top players. In the women's side, like Wisconsin and Minnesota, their top players are were already centralized with with right. the, the U.S. And, and Canada. You know, UMD had already lost Ashton Bell before the season, but it's like St. Cloud, UMD, um, Ohio State is without their top goaltender as well. Um, she plays for Switzerland. Like the Europeans don't centralize. So all of them started the year with the teams. Heck, they didn't even know if they were gonna be in the Olympics or not because uh, the European teams, you know, named the, their teams so late. Um, so it, it is interesting. It's, it's crazy that St. Cloud was able to, to pick up points against uh, Wisconsin there when the Badgers have their, well, somewhat full team, um, they don't always, uh, you know, fill those roster spots when they lose players to the Olympics. But, yeah, the Badgers and the Gophers on the women's side, they have their full teams. They don't lose anyone. Whereas, um, you know, the Europeans, they all took off last week. They had to leave early. That women's team, act, the women's tournament gets underway before the, the opening ceremonies, actually, at the Olympics. So they can squeeze uh, all that hockey in. So, yeah, that was a big, that was a big result for, for the Huskies. And, um, really, you know, delivered a blow to the to the Badgers as we saw them kind of slip in the pairwise, slip in the the WCHA standings, and and all of a sudden the the Gopher women, Jess, who we talked about at the beginning of the year having something to prove, are uh, the number one team in the WCHA and country. Yeah, I was going to say that was a big result for the Huskies. That was a real big result for the Gophers, who go out to Ohio State. They get four out of six points there. Um, you know, I, w I was on the team plane coming home on Saturday night and the women's team was on the same plane. So I talked to Brad Frost for a little while and, you know, they had had to sit on the tarmac in South Bend and play cards for about an hour and a half waiting for the men's team to, to, to get there. And Hey, he was in a great mood. He was, nothing was bothering him then, uh, going into Ohio state and doing as well as they did. And you're absolutely right, Matt. I mean, you know, Abby Murphy was gone at the start of the season, you know, uh, Zumwinkle was gone at the start of the season for the Gophers. So this is their team. They're playing with, with what they've had. They do have two, two Europeans, uh, going to the Olympics, both of them incoming recruits, one from Finland, one from Sweden. So, um, you know, they, they're in a really good position right now they've got Bemidji State coming in to Ritter Arena this coming weekend um you know so uh, you know by all accounts they should probably be the number one team when the polls come out I haven't seen them yet maybe maybe they, they are, are number one okay they're number yep. one yep 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 um, I was going to say, you know, since, since we're talking about, uh, you know, Big Ten teams, uh, the two biggest bits of news I thought on the men's side over the weekend were off the ice. Number one, Rick Bennett, who coached Union to a national championship in 2014, beat the Gophers in the, in the finale. Um, a lot of it on the strength of Shane Gossespierre and what he did in that game and, and, you know, what he did just overall as a player. Uh, Rick Bennett resigned over the weekend. He had, was under uh, investigation by the school and just decided, you know what, time for me to go. That, that was a big change, obviously. And then the other bit of news we heard, uh, there's an ongoing investigation at Michigan and Mel Pearson's program is being looked at. And I, and I say Mel Pearson's program, but some of this goes back to long before Mel Pearson even got there. I mean, it sounds like it's kind of a, a system-wide look at the Michigan program. There have been some accusations of misogyny and you know creating a hostile environment uh, toward the women who have worked in that program. Uh, obviously not a good look there. There were some things about possibly trying to falsify COVID tests last year. And of course, as we know, Michigan was supposed to play in the NCAA tournament. At the last minute, they couldn't play UMB and just had to go home. And, and UMB essentially got a bye in the first round last year. And then, you know, the ongoing stuff about the cancellation of the GLI or the attempted cancellation of the GLI. Um, some more news came out last week. Some freedom of information requests were filed and, you know, some emails were revealed that, Mel Pearson had indeed advocated, you know, months ago, canceling the GLI. Uh, of course, they wound up playing one of the two games, the, the first game against Michigan Tech, and then they canceled their game against Western Michigan, and, and that drew a lot of fire. So uh, not good times in Ann Arbor right now, except for on the ice where they go to Wisconsin, they get a sweep, and they've opened up a nine-point lead on the Gophers in the Big Ten. So, um, you know, they're the odds-on favorite to big, win the Big Ten this season, and this is obviously a Michigan team that could win a national championship. You just have to wonder how much of this off-ice stuff is going to 
kind of creep into what they do and what they are right now. Matt, of the, GL, of the GLI, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, so there's there's what there's five five Division One programs in Michigan. Help me out here. Seven. North. Seven. Okay, seven. Right, but they rotate those they rotate those teams every year, right? Well, so the GLI, the I guess the former Mich- Northern Michigan beat writer should should have answered that how many teams are there in Michigan way quicker than he did. But he's also a Northern Michigan grad, so math it takes a while for for me to do that. Um, I'll admit, didn't, 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 well, only went to half my math class uh, that one semester I took it at, at Northern Michigan, and they still gave me a diploma. Um, yeah, the, so that's kind of a new thing. It used to be, so you have Michigan Tech as the, the host, the keeper, the, the GLI. Um, like many things in college hockey, it, it belongs to Michigan Tech because they've been around so long. But um, And then Michigan and Michigan State are also part of it. They've always been part of it. And they've rotated that, that fourth team. And, and for a while, they brought teams from outside of Michigan. Um, and then recently, they started bringing in, you know, Northern, Lake State, Ferris, Western, um, into the fold. So it's supposed to be Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan Tech, and then one other school every year. But um, after those, you know, this past year, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic or if they're just not drawing what they used to, to, well, used to be Joe Lewis Arena, now it's uh, Little Caesars Arena. They did it as a showcase at Michigan and Michigan State, which not a lot of people were happy about. Um, so there's calls now to, to kick Michigan out of the GLI after those emails. After a Redditor, um, FYI, don't use your email for government for any type of communication. <laughs> if you work for the government, because someone could FOIA it. Whether um, a, a as, as a reporter, a Redditor, as a reporter, as a reporter, please keep using your email for anything official. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, don't don't use email. Uh, don't use text. Those can be discoverable as well, but they're a little harder. Um, yeah, Mel, uh, you know, faced some embarrassment there right now with with those uh, emails coming out. And, um, you know, it wasn't a reporter that went after the emails. As far as I could tell, uh, a reporter did go after the the investigation that Jess mentioned, uh, those emails. But um, just someone on Reddit went and got those emails from probably an angry tech fan. Um, kudos <laughs> to the tech fan for using legal methods, not just trying to hack something to get it either. That's usually tech's MO is whether it's a Hobie Baker fan vote or something else, just hacking it. Wow. Um, wow, the Northern grad is going hard hey. after the arch rival. Hey, I don't know how they do it. It's, again, the, the tech grads are way smarter than me. The, you know, kudos to their ability with using using computers. Um, you know, my university gives out free computers. The university gave out free computers, but we don't know how to do anything useful with them besides, you know, illegally download music, tech people, hack the Hobie Baker fan vote. Um, wow. Anyway, yeah, uh, we're way off the rails here, uh, which is typical for this. But yeah, it's interesting what's going on with Michigan. Uh, guys, we forget they're also number one in the pairwise. Um, the human polls, nope, we won't give them that number one vote um, in there right now. But, uh, you know, Michigan's number one in the pairwise. They are sitting in a, in a pretty good spot, but. Um, We'll see how they uh, perform down the road here, minus some of their key players to, to the Olympics. I've got one more point to make on Michigan, because I read this yesterday. Uh, somebody wrote, it was an NHL writer, and they said, the Sabres are obviously interested in signing Owen Power. No matter what he does at the Olympics, the Sabres are interested in signing Owen Power, the Michigan's top defenseman, number one overall pick last year, as soon as the Michigan season ends. And my first thought was, is that a rule now? Do we actually wait for the season to end? Because that didn't seem to apply at Minnesota. I mean, would you really end your college career early to go play for the Buffalo Sabres? Like, isn't it possible the Michigan could play longer than, than the Buffalo Sabres? That, 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 is, like, that, that is actually very Sabres possible. Are still playing? I don't, I don't know. Why, why are you rushing to go to Buffalo? <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> Matt came on today excited to bring the heat. That's... <laughs> That's all we're getting just, just, today. I'm just, home with I'm home with a three year old. Just two just to circle back, years. Matt's got a three year old. Pop, yeah, I've been watching Paw Patrol and Encanto. I, this is this is this is my break from Paw Patrol Matt, and Encanto right now. Matt, Matt clearly didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so. I I guess too to kind of bring us back in here a little bit. A lot that Matt just brought out that we have to unpack here a little bit. 
I think <laughs> but guys too that I want to know what you you guys think too. How does this affect not only the Michigan program, but how do you think this is going to affect college hockey moving forward for the rest of this season? I think a lot of people when Michigan pulled their cancellation when that news broke a few weeks ago, lots of fans still haven't forgotten it, still not letting it go. They're still taking a lot of heat for it from college hockey fans, writers, players everywhere. So I want to know what you guys think and how this impacts the landscape this season. I think that, well, I think the big thing, I guess, is is like how like it's going to affect conference races, and we we've kind of talked a little bit about that before. But you know, I, I think like a team like Den, you know, like Denver right now, who, who's they're kind of threatening to kind of run away a little. You say that, and they got a three point lead in the in the conference standings. But at the same time, with the way that they're playing, and with them not losing anybody, uh, you know, to the Olympics. Um, you know, I think that puts them in a great spot. Western Michigan, same thing there, right? I mean, and you know, Matt just saw Western Michigan. Western Michigan, Western Michigan isn't going away either. So, I mean, I think it, you know, for for like those two teams in particular, I think it, it could be a big boost for them. Um, you know, and and it wouldn't surprise me in the least if if they end up being the top two teams. You